Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Narani Nimpuno and I'm the head of outreach, sorry, of global engagement, including outreach uh, at Links to London Internet Exchange. And uh, today's presentation is part of a series of presentations called the Distinguished Speaker Series that Links has been rolling out over the last few months and will continue to do so in the coming months, where we invite uh, experts in the industry who have a unique uh, experience perspective, experience and knowledge that we want to share with the broader community. So this is an open webinar that's available live, but we will also publish this on the Lynx website and on YouTube afterwards. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Dr. Steve Crocker. Dr. Crocker is the CEO and co-founder of Shinkuru, a startup company focused on dynamic sharing of information across the internet and the deployment of improved security protocols. Dr. Crocker is truly an internet pioneer. He has been involved in the internet since its inception in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, while he was a graduate student at UCLA, who is part of the team that developed the protocols for the ARPANET and laid the foundation of today's internet. He organized the networking, a network working group, which was the forerunner of the modern internet engineering task force and initiated the request for comment RFC series of notes through which protocol designs and documented, are documented and shared. So that is in fact the instructions for the internet um, that we still use today. For this work, Dr. Crocker was awarded the 2002 IEEE Internet Award. Starting in 2002, Dr. Crocker served as a founding chair of the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, ESAC, of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. Dr. Crocker's experience includes research management at DARPA, USC ISI, and the Aerospace Corporation, Vice President of Trusted Information Systems and co-founder of CyberCache, Inc. and Longitude Systems. His prior public service includes serving as the first area director for security in the IETF, the Internet Architecture Board, IAB, the IETF Administrative Support Activity Oversight Committee, IAOC, serves on the board of the Internet Society as well. Dr. Crocker was selected to the ICANN Board of Trustees in 2008, and he served as chair from 2011 to 2017. Dr. Crocker has been inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame uh, in 2012. As a pioneer, recognize him as an individual who's instrumental in the early design and development of the Internet. So as you can imagine, we are very honored to have Dr. Crocker speaking with us today. And he will be talking about who is rebuilding, who is from the ground up. Dr. Crocker, the floor is yours, over to you. Thank you, Narani, and thank you for that lengthy recitation of my past sins. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I uh, was heavily involved with ICANN over a several year period from 2002 to 2017 when I finally completed my service on the board. Uh, and since then, I have been working quietly with a, a small team and I want to tell you all about it. Let me see if we can do the screen sharing thing here just right. Um, And now, have I got the uh, correct view for everyone? Just swap the displays around, Steve. This is better? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, one of the sort of nagging and, and intractable problems that uh, I watched over a very long period of time uh, including from the um, advantaged perch of sitting as, as chair of the ICANN board, was the endless haranguing about who is, um, people unhappy and several things. So I've, I had intended to step away cleanly, but that gnawed at me. And so uh, I wanna share with you work that we've been doing, a small group of us have been doing uh, quietly for the past couple of years, and that we're about to uh, try to bring into the public uh, 
uh, into the public so everybody sees it. So here's uh, a, um, uh, a, a diagram uh, of sort of what everybody understands this, that you have um, registrations in the domain name system. Uh, RT is a registrant, provides information to the registrar. That information consists notionally of three kinds of information, DNS records, contacts, like admin and, and uh, who uh, tech contact and so forth, and uh, some more sensitive information about the account that is maintained with the registrar. Some of that information goes up to the registry, and some of that information, the DNS records, are made available through name servers that are available publicly on the internet to arbitrary users uh, around the internet. And the added part that is causing all the trouble, in a sense, is that uh, people also try to look up information about the registration. And so here, uh, symbolized as requesters, uh, asking for information about contact information, usually that either goes to the registrar or sometimes to the registry. Prior to GDPR, um, it was estimated that there were on the order of 5 billion queries per month. Uh, that's reduced somewhat with GDPR. Uh, and this is against an aggregate database across the entire uh, internet of uh, more than 400 million registrations. This data, as we know, is used for a wide variety of things, some of which uh, on the right are uh, perhaps not what you'd want to see, but get used that way nonetheless. Historically, the, the who is information was originally created for the ARPANET back at a time before the domain name system was invented and before the ARPANET was connected to other networks. So it was before the internet and it was before DNS. Um, and the information was primarily so that the people that we would now call system administrators, we didn't actually have that term at the time, uh, could find each other and help debug uh, operational problems between the time shared systems that were connected to the network. Um, this was well before personal computers existed and uh, as I said, well before the domain name system and well before the web um, was created. So it goes back uh, into archeological times practically. And uh, one of the issues that we're dealing with today is that some of the structure is left over and is um, uh, no longer exactly uh, relevant. So we have a very peculiar ecology that has emerged. Um, the primary information that's needed for registration is uh, taken care of directly between the registrar and the registrar. And the registrar knows how to reach the registrar. He's got his credit card, phone numbers, uh, and he knows what to do if he can't reach them. Um, and nonetheless, we have all of this other data that other people want. Um, and as I said, we have these admin and tech contacts that originated back in the, in the pre-internet days. And over the 40 plus years since then and the million fold expansion, um, things have evolved so that these terms do not have any standardized meaning, uh, but nonetheless, we carry them. In some cases, they're, in some settings, their admin contact is given particular uh, role and authority, but that's not uniform and not very well documented. And nonetheless, we have many, many third parties heavily dependent upon this data. And if you look at it from an economic point of view, who, who pays, the costs are all imposed on the registrant uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and the registrars and the registries. All, of, all those costs, of course, get passed back to the registrant. Uh, essentially, none of the cost is borne by the people who make use of that data. Lots of complaints period, uh, continuously over time that the data is inaccurate, that there's a lack of responses, that people get harassed and that it's costly to operate. Uh, and then many, many um, attempts at trying to fix this. Uh, ICANN has a policy development process which uh, has to its benefit a requirement that every group gets represented and consensus is required, but that process does not necessarily uh, result in solutions to all problems. Uh, and to a certain extent, the way it's organized, it's focused on the GTLD community, not on the CCTLDs or the uh, address community, the RIRs. Many, many reports, working groups, review teams. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but 
Uh, just to pick out one of them, the Who Is review team recommendations in 2013 included such things as um, uh, reduce who is inaccuracy by 50% recommendation six. Um, uh, one could come at it the other way and say, well, how come the information is as accurate as it is <coughs> since there's no inherent uh, requirement, no, no inherent force or uh, need from the re registrant's point of view to actually provide any accurate information. Um, from my perspective, I've been watching this, as I said, for a long time. And when I say a long time, I'm not talking about years. I'm talking more like decades. Um, and watching this sort of evolve in a way that just doesn't seem uh, very incisive and pointed at getting at the underlying issues. Um, and indeed, the type of reports that get uh, written in the review process tend not to go to first principles and ask sort of the underlying questions of what is this good for and, and why do we have it? Everybody's aware, of course, of GDPR, which made a major change. Um, but from my point of view, it was, it's been a very crude change. It's, it's caused the pendulum to swing sharply over to the uh, uh, privacy side, but it has not engendered uh, very much deep analysis as to uh, what the whole system is and how to tailor it. <coughs> I think privacy is a good thing. I'm happy to see this. And on the other hand, I'm not happy to see it done as, uh, as sort of as, as bluntly and, and uh, uh, superficially as it's been done. But lots and lots of energy has been expended now on um, trying to make sure that everybody can avoid the onerous penalties that GDPR and other privacy uh, regimes now require. Uh, that's good for getting attention, not so good for uh, uh, sort of deeper thought. It has had a big effect. Um, estimated a reduction of who is queries is down by 30% and perhaps it's more than that. Uh, but we still don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I suppose if your sole focus is privacy, that's a great thing. But from a broader perspective of trying to balance the needs of all the different parties, uh, it's not so good. So, um, as I mentioned, um, this sort of sat in my craw as I uh, stepped away from ICANN, and I um, uh, thought maybe I could spend some time, uh, now that I wasn't under the pressure of the day-to-day -day, uh, activities, and think hard about it. Um, and we put together a project. The, uh, the motivation is pretty much as I've said, and the question is, can we change the game? Can we start with fundamentals? Can we create some tools and building blocks and facilitate the work of others? Uh, not intending as a sales pitch, but uh, trying to stimulate a sort of deeper conversation. We put together a small group of uh, people who were similarly, um, uh, in a similar position of having observed uh, things over a long time, very knowledgeable about uh, both how things actually worked and, and the various business and technical issues, and uh, formed what in the ITF would be called the design team, just a self-selected small group of people. Uh, no authority, no, no status, uh, just uh, people comfortable talking with each other. Um, we humorously call ourselves a barbecue group. It's a play on uh, words because there was a group of French mathematicians in the last century who published an influential set of papers and didn't put their names to it. And they adopted the name Bourbaki after a, uh, a French general. And so this is a, a silly pun on that. Uh, and the only reason for not listing the individuals is that although their companies that they work for are more than happy to have them participate, this avoids the implication that the work is endorsed or reviewed or in any case uh, 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 has any force behind it at, at the present part. The overall project has uh, in principle three parts, uh, building and socializing a model framework, which is what I'm going to take you through today. Uh, when we come to a, uh, a resting point on that, which I think will be fairly soon, then others, people can uh, engage in shaping policy and governance, see whether the tools we've developed and the concepts we've developed are helpful. And then 
maybe sometime down down the road, one can think of a um, RDDS, uh, that's the term of art today, registration data directory services, uh, as a platform that can be used in a more positive way for other services uh, and not just as a drag on the entire system. So as I said, we're focused uh, on just part one today, uh, but I'll be happy to have some discussion later if you want about where things go after this. Um, two key aspects of registration data directory services are uh, on the collection side. Uh, what are the policies for collecting and labeling the data elements? And on the uh, request or query side, uh, what are the queries and, and what kind of responses are expected from that? Um, we have in mind that the uh, kind of thing that I'm going to take you through is useful at multiple stages in discussions. Um, most of the, of the uh, public discussions take place, are focused on can we come up with a policy and, and decisions made by consensus. That's important, but it's, it's the end state. It's the end of a process. If you back up, um, it's important for all parties to be able to have internal discussions about what their policies are or what policies they'd like to see others have. Uh, and so the tools that we've uh, built are, um, are, are intended to be useful sort of in the privacy of your own uh, organization as well as publicly. And then uh, during discussions or negotiations to be able to compare different proposals and then finally uh, for external consumption, either decisions that have been made or documentation of existing uh, uh, policies. Next slide, please. Our approach is uh, a little bit different from uh, what you may have seen in other settings. Uh, we're focused on basic concepts that go into policies. What you see is not intended and, and to be an implementation, not even a prototype of an implementation. Uh, some of the concepts are easily to implement, but not all of them are. For example, uh, one of the concepts is, includes a search or a, what's sometimes called reverse lookup. That isn't actually implemented in a lot of places, but it's more important from our point of view to be able to express what you might want um, and then separate that from whether or not you can or should have that. Second point is that our, our uh, perspective is internet-wide, not just GTLDs. Um, we're quite aware and have followed closely the work that's going on in ICANN uh, to produce its, its SSAD. Um, that's an important case, and maybe it will be the only important case, but our perspective is, uh, as I say, broader than that, and you'll see in a minute uh, where we, sort of how we position things. Um, we're also looking at, um, we, we take privacy as normal. Uh, GDPR is important, but it's not the only privacy regime. Uh, we think all of that should fall out fairly naturally. Um, we also take a very wide angle approach asking uh, what the policy is with respect to all of the data that is collected or generated during registration. So for example, uh, an easy case is DNS records are obviously passed from the registrant to the uh, registrar and then published in the, uh, made available through name servers. Uh, that's all public information of necessity, um, but rather than just rule it out of uh, order and say we're not in scope, we say it's in scope, but the, the expectation is that a, any policy statement would say, and of course everybody has access to it. At the other end of that spectrum are, are data elements that would be uh, generally thought of as very private, for example, credit card uh, information or uh, payment histories or other details that um, uh, you would not like to see published. But there are circumstances, obviously, if you have law enforcement, particularly if they come in armed with a subpoena or warrant or other appropriate paperwork, where they can ask and get that information and so, as I say, in terms of constructing a framework and a model that encompasses all of this, we try to put all of that in there. Um, a more subtle and uh, uh, very interesting and, and powerful uh, thought is that it turns out there's a lot of different policies. Not all of them are documented and ex stated explicitly, uh, but I'll show you a picture in a moment 
but you have not only the policy that a registrar might have as to what data they collect, but you also have uh, constraints that are imposed by ICANN in some cases, by governments in other cases, by registries that they're working for and so forth. And if you bring the implied policies, uh, some of which are documented, some of which are not, but if you try to document all of them, then you can ask what are the interplay between all of that? So an interesting kind of scenario is what happens to a registrar that is trying to operate uh, globally and discovers that it's got a conflicting set of requirements from say, the US on the one hand and the EU on the other hand, uh, what is a poor registrar to do? Uh, there's no simple answer to that, but at the very least, being able to expose and compare uh, these things uh, helps bring those things to light and lead hopefully to um, a resolution. And then finally, as I, as I said before, we wanna be able to express policies that are still in the desired or planning stage, not just at the final uh, or actual operational stage. Next slide, please. So here's the picture that has, uh, similar to what I showed you before, but has uh, two important additions. Uh, you have policy uh, add-on, if you will, at all these different levels. And then you have, uh, and you have policy bodies like ICANN and the governments. And then over on the left, instead of just requesters going directly to registrars or registries have a more complex arrangement in which requesters go through uh, uh, an accrediting authority, depending upon who they are, and that includes uh, anonymous public queries for which the accrediting authority is just a pass-through. Um, and then there are clearing houses. Uh, one can think of the ICANN SSAD as one possible clearing house, but there could be many others and arrangements in which some, um, uh, some registrars and some registries are members of some clearing houses and not of others. And in the extreme, you have situations where you have private arrangements where a registrar might have a business uh, agreement with certain businesses. And in, in our thinking, that's the equivalent of a uh, small, if you like, clearing house that is operated by the registrar uh, all of this fits into a nice clean framework here uh, and just in order to provide accommodation to all these different uh, perspectives. And the next slide, please. Each of these mechanisms uh, has some sort of governance associated with it. And so if one looks at how all of this plays out, uh, you can ask, well, who makes the decisions? Who sets the rules? Uh, who is affected by them? And I've shown here four different places where there are governance. Not shown on here is uh, uh, there's also a registry of what the data elements are, just the data dictionary. And there's got to be a governance process that controls what data elements are added to and how those are defined and so forth. Next slide, please. So what does a query look like? Uh, a query comes in from a requester and it's got um, a bunch of information about who's making the request, what the purpose is, what their credentials are, and so forth. And then uh, a set of details about what, uh, what data elements are being requested and um, what level of um, access uh, is, being, uh, is being requested. So I'm using the word sensitivity here as a covering term that includes things that are marked public versus private. And in our thinking, as you'll see in a second, um, we, we, we sense that there are actually multiple levels of sensitivity. Uh, we have chosen four levels ranging from uh, S0 pu pu uh, public, S1 private, S2 very private, and S3, um, you better have uh, a warrant or something equivalent to get out it. This is not trying to impose anything on the community. This is more a reflection of what we've heard and how we interpret what we've heard. Um, there's also a question of what, uh, what review is performed in the course of a, uh, making a request, whether it's expected that this will be handled automatically or whether or not the, um, the various parties that have the data may subject it to a manual review. Um, there's a obviously very sensitive question as to whether or not a request is accepted. And 
uh, uh, skip over that because that's where everybody else is putting all of the energy in, and we take that as a uh, as a given. But then in the sort of less visible part, uh, what data elements are actually returned for a given uh, request? Uh, next slide, please. So this just highlights uh, where the focus of our work is compared to uh, uh, others that are working in this space. Next slide, please. And again. So in order, now we're diving into what does it take to express a policy? Well, uh, one of the things, as I've mentioned, is there has to be a, a, a common dictionary of data elements. Um, uh, these are the uh, DNS records, these are the contact information, and for every uh, pr individual contact, a whole series of separate data elements, name, organization, address, address broken down into uh, uh, fine grained details ranging from country all the way to, to street address, um, email address, phone numbers, etc. And um, uh, a set of attributes associated with each data element. Uh, one is, is it required or is it optional or is it simply not collected? And I'll show you examples of each of those. A different one is what level of validation. And here again, uh, in listening and interpreting what we've heard, uh, it seems again there's, there's four useful levels. Uh, which we just labeled from V0 to V3. V0 meaning take anything that's given with no checking. V1 is syntactic uh, sensibility. V, V2 is it's operational. And V3 is uh, there's strong reason to believe that it matches uh, the uh, information associated with this registration. <coughs> we also um, uh, we, while taking privacy as a default, um, there is a, a fairly strong set of registrants that will say, well, thank you very much for protecting me, but we want our data or we want these particular fields to be public. Is that permitted? And so part of the uh, policy on the collection side is whether they make it possible for the registrant to express that. And then a labeling as to whether or not that data element's retained. This is a way of distinguishing the, uh, what happens at the registrar level versus the registry level versus the policy authority. Um, at the registrar, basically everything's retained. At the policy authority level, uh, essentially no information is passed up to them. And at the registry level, you have a distinction between thin and thick registries. And, um, this makes it possible to be detailed about what data elements are retained in those different circumstances. <coughs> to me. There's also a question of scope or applicability. Um, a, a registrar, for example, might have different policies about what data is collected from a natural person versus a legal person uh, and, what, and how that data is labeled with respect to making it available to others. And there are other distinctions which I won't uh, get into um, and I imagine will change over a period of time. And then, of course, there could be different policies for dealing with different TLDs. On the request side, um, uh, one could imagine that a request would be very detailed, saying, I want this field, I don't want that field, and so forth. As a practical matter, uh, the world doesn't really work that way. And we've arranged that it's possible to express fairly compactly certain subsets of data that is expected to be returned with the idea that those would be worked out uh, in advance so that it's easy to repeat similar kinds of requests. That's an area that obviously is worth some discussion. Next slide, please. So this it goes into another level of detail about the data dictionary. Uh, I've covered most of this in what I've said so far, so we'll just move on in the interest of time. Next slide. This is a snapshot, oops, back up one. This is a snapshot of what the collection looks like in uh, the tools that we built so far. Um, it's obviously too small to read, but I'll just uh, name the critical sections there. The pale yellow on the left is the data dictionary and every single line is a separate data element. At the very top, is information about uh, what this policy, what the status of this policy is, 
uh, whose is it, and is it draft or final, is it proposed or, or actual, um, uh, what's the uh, distribution, is this for internal use only, or is this uh, public, or is it some level in between, and then the, uh, the uh, uh, greenish blue um, is what the scope is, which KLDs and so forth, and then the major part of it has all of the details about whether the da each data element is collected or not collected, what level of validation, what level of sensitivity, is it okay to request to make it public and so forth, and whether it's stored or retained. Next slide, please. And again, a request is also uh, a, uh, in this template form. Um, one can think of this request as uh, existing uh, on a sort of pre-printed pad. Uh, one can imagine the law enforcement agencies might have one or more of these pads that uh, have um, uh, various fields all filled in except for the last part, which is what, uh, what uh, domain we're looking up or something like that. Um, and so that the pad is symbolized on the upper right there. Um, the details, you can think of the orange, the, the fields that are preceded in orange are filled in in advance, and then the fields that are preceded by green are uh, filled in for a particular request. Uh, so what you see here is uh, a request that one might think of as something that trademark attorneys or others might use, which would say um, that the identification of the requester is required that no reverse search is included, the domain name is required, uh, but you can't do a search on contacts or email, uh, that the processing is manual, which means that it'd be subject to review by the uh, authorities that, uh, the parties that have the data. Um, and over on the right, uh, that we're asking for DNS and registration information, not the forensic information like uh, uh, credit card details and so forth, and all of the details about organization uh, and location, uh, and the sensitivity level is marked here as very private, um, but uh, this would only be available to properly credentialed uh, people. And th this is just an illustration. This does not represent a decision uh, by anybody, not by my part, not on our part or, or anybody else's. Next slide, please. When we step back and take a look at the, uh, uh, what the overall uh, system looks like of, of queries and responses, uh, I find it helpful to think of queries as falling into uh, potentially five different buckets. Um, anonymous requests by arbitrary people with no, uh, no restrictions, sort of the old who is. Um, Requests that could be made by anybody, but with identification and uh, attribution and some obligation that they not abuse the, uh, uh, the response. And then credentialed requests, uh, either automated or uh, one subject to manual review, and then a catch-all bucket of none of the above. And for all of these, one can ask, uh, what are the legal requirements? How many requests of these kinds? What are their purposes? What's the cost? What's the governance model? and effectiveness and perhaps other kinds of questions. Next slide, please. So that's a quick tour of what we're doing. Where we are is the following. We're uh, going to try to emerge into the sunlight. Uh, we're in the process of forming a nonprofit organization um, and then making all of this available for uh, uh, non-commercial use. Um, and then interacting with people. We've interacted privately with quite a few parties, uh, but uh, we'll move into a whole different state of uh, seeing whether the tools that we've built and the concepts that we have are useful for public discussions or internal private discussions uh, of expressing desired and actual policies. And that inevitably will lead to revisions uh, as needed. And then uh, hopefully, this has some positive impact on engaging with the community on uh, utility or effectiveness and cost or efficiency and perhaps other uh, kind of uh, hopefully measurable kinds of questions that get into the policy area. But as I say, we're not, we're not intending to make policy so much as to facilitate other people 
uh, having more precise and uh, focused discussions about how to make effective policy and how to stimulate discussion where we can identify the parts that people agree on and also the parts that um, simply require uh, value judgments and uh, uh, the trade-offs that happen in political domains. Uh, I think that's it. The next slide I think says, let's discuss. Thanks. Um, so that's the end of the formal presentation. And I am available and willing and eager to engage in any interaction that you have. Thank you very much, um, Steve, for a very interesting presentation, uh, indeed, of this very highly relevant work. It's good to see that you are, you've clearly been staying very busy. Good to see that you're continuing to add value in the ICANN and the broader internet community. Thank you. Um, so um, there are a few questions uh, from the audience, um, and I'll see if I can include some of my own questions as well. So. Um, there's a question from Bijal Sanghani um, that there are some challenges with the RIR whose databases in the VRIPE region and it was a database created for network operators and troubleshooting and, re and reaching the correct counterparts and other networks but that purpose has shifted over the years and there are some similar issues with regards to purpose, accuracy, use etc. Uh, there's now a database task force in the RIPE community taking on the task of resolving those. Do you have any advice to them or is there anything in your work that could be applicable to the RIR's IP addressing databases? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, we, we clearly have in mind that uh, the work that we're doing here should be applicable to the RIRs as well as to the, uh, to the name community, the names community. Uh, uh, the um, uh, to go a bit further, uh, I use the terms framework and policy, uh, framework and model, uh, and the distinction is that the the framework is sort of the course uh, structure, the growth structure of it, and then the model are the detailed data elements and and uh, business rules related to each of these. I would expect uh, one of two things in terms of applying what you what I've shown here to the. Uh, to the address community. It could be that the same data elements and roughly the same business rules apply, or it could be that it's different, uh, which would lead to a different model, but the same framework uh, structure. Uh, in any case, um, I, I would be very, very eager to, uh, to see this uh, attempted to be used and to see what the response is. Interesting. Thank you for that. And, and I think, um, uh, it's interesting to see because indeed the who is this very complex issue and and uh, there are many different aspects to it but uh, I think it was uh, great to see how you broke it down in uh, in the beginning of your presentation um, and I think you're very clear in this that you're not trying to address all the challenges with who is uh, but only really one part of it um, so you touched upon that a little bit, but could you expand a little bit uh, on how you think that the work you've done with this model and framework, how it can actually support resolving some of the other challenges uh, with who is? Uh, thank you. Um, the um, uh, let me let me you know take a couple of cases. Uh, pr prior to GDPR, WHOIS was wide open and there were a lot of public uh, queries and a lot of complaints about the accuracy, a lot of complaints about uh, misuse of the data and so forth. Uh, some information is still available publicly. Uh, one could ask from a, from a broad policy point of view, is, is that class of information useful as a serving purpose, what do we know about it? What do we know about it? Not just in terms of the easy to measure things like how many queries there are, but uh, is it possible to understand more broadly uh, how effective that is? Then when you move into the non-public queries, who's making the queries and what are they using it for and how useful are the responses they're getting? Um, and I think that Although there are strong opinions, I don't think there is a lot of strong data. Uh, and I think that it may be hard to bring it all to the surface. 
So for example, one could work with the law enforcement community and say, are they being served well enough? Uh, and uh, can one sort those issues out? One could uh, interact with the intellectual property community and ask similar questions. One could interact with security researchers and say, well, what do you need? And, and how do you balance what you think you need versus what other people think should be kept mm -hmm. private and so forth? Each of these, I think, is a serious kind of question that can be looked at in some depth. Uh, my hope is that uh, using the approach we have here, it's possible to frame some of those questions and then open up uh, the, uh, the process of doing some serious research along those lines. Uh, this is not instantaneous. This does not happen quickly um, and will seem quite frustrating to people who want answers now. Uh, my perspective has been informed by watching people who want answers now, right now, right now, this year, and five years later, right now, right now, and five years later, right now, right now. And um, so I'm, I'm sort of more relaxed about what it's going to take to do this in a serious way. And even if it takes a little longer than you want, it'd be good to try to get out of the uh, vicious cycle of never quite getting anything uh, resolved. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, there are a few questions I see in relation to RDAP. So uh, what's the relationship of this setup with RDAP? Does RDAP need replacement or update or is it unaffected? Uh, I'll do all the RDAP questions together. How does this model work with RDAP? Does it replace it? Uh, and also, do you expect this model can be implemented using RDAP or would a new protocol need to be developed or would a simple web interface or form be sufficient? So there are a bunch of questions in there for you. Yeah, um, uh, I'll try to answer some of it. I'm not sure to get all of it. Um, there clearly is a lot of focus on the use of RDAP as an access control, uh, as an access method and, and a, uh, a control protocol. Quite a lot of what is expressible in our model uh, does map directly into RDAP queries. And we've watched closely um, the, uh, uh, the work that's gone on at ICANN in the uh, TSG uh, and ask questions along the line, how much of what they uh, can implement matches what we can express and vice versa. There are some things that we can express that don't have a, an easy mapping there. That does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, those ideas would be uh, accepted and, and desired. Um, and as I said, particularly the idea of the reverse search um, is not something that maps cleanly into existing implementations. So if one, if, if the community said, well, that's now, we, we recognize that that would be important. How do we get that? Then that would trigger some serious protocol work. But a very, very large portion of what we can express uh, does have direct mapping. And so uh, one of the things one would want to know about a, a given policy expression is, uh, to what extent it's easy to implement or it's not so easy to implement. Um, I don't have any strong view about what has to change and what doesn't have to change. Um, I think those questions are relatively straightforward to approach one once you have a way of expressing both where you are and where you want to go. Um, and the path from one to the other can then be worked out. But we don't have at the moment uh, any good tools for even expressing where we are and where we want to go. Okay, that's a very, very good answer. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll throw another question. Uh, clearly, it's an engaging topic. So from Paul Wilson, regarding the I-18N, have you considered the need to have not only internationalized content, but also to have multiple alternatives, representations of individual data elements, such as names and addresses? In some countries, there can be multiple representations which need to be recorded simultaneously. Well, thank you for that, Paul. Yes, uh, I-18N, for those who aren't uh, familiar with it, is a uh, peculiar shorthand for internationalization. Um, uh, I, truly, I haven't thought hard about that particular aspect, um, but yes, that would be an important element to, to deal with. Um, <coughs> and, 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 and Paul, you're, uh, you're in the region where that would be obviously of great importance, where you have multiple languages, character sets, etc. Um, 
Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that I, uh, although I hadn't anticipated that particular one, that f fits into the expectation that once you think that you've got things organized, you then get surprised uh, by what you haven't thought about. Um, there's an old, uh, there's an old uh, uh, saying that uh, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, uh, and here we are. Indeed. Um... So I have a, a, a question that's maybe a bit more philosophical in, in nature that I don't know, obviously don't uh, expect you to resolve in, in this session, but I just would like to hear your thoughts on it because I think we see similar challenges with uh, the RIR's databases and, mm -hmm. and that comes down to what many see as an inherent uh, challenge with the purpose of the database, given that there's both a need for uh, useful, clear, accessible data, uh, but there are also privacy concerns and um, in some cases are also very strict regulation on that data. So unless we can agree on the actual purpose and the scope of who is, um, we will always be faced with that inherent um, contradiction. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. Um, so I, 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 it is, maybe I should have said this all very clearly before, <coughs> I mean, take it as a given that you don't want to collect data unless you've got a good justification for doing that. The justification has to include uh, what the intended purpose of it is, and then all of the other uh, requirements of is this data necessary for that purpose, is it effective for that purpose, uh, and what are the controls on, on who should have access to it, and so forth. Um, what so we take all that as a given that that has to exist and if that doesn't exist then um you know it's a legitimate question of why why is anybody doing this and uh what we've tried to do here is take that as a given and say okay once you've got decisions so that you do want to collect certain data and that you do know the reasons for it how do you express all that and can you take can everybody who enters into those discussions agree on on um, on, on those details and if they think if they have differences then those should be brought to the surface fairly quickly um, as an example uh, as i as i've mentioned we have uh, a um, you know close to a 50-year history of collecting admin and tech contacts and then if you ask the simple question well what do those actually mean uh, and let me take that and make that more precise in in, in two respects if somebody is named as an admin contact, I would expect that there are two questions that that person should be able to answer and the same two questions that everybody else should be able to answer. What is the authority uh, invested in that person? What are they allowed to do? And what are the responsibilities? What are, they, what are they obligated to do? And the person who's named in that role should obviously know the answer to that. And everybody else should have the same expectations. And I, I challenge you uh, that if you look around to see, okay, so somebody's name does an admin contact or a tech contact, where do you find the documentation on uh, what that person's responsibility and authority are? And there are a few exceptions where uh, limited, limited uh, properties are associated, but in general, that just doesn't exist. So one could say, well, in that case, let's just get rid of those. Well, that may be the right answer, or it may be, well, wait a minute, that's turned out to be useful for other reasons. So there is a more precise discussion to be had. Uh, and I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have enough data to know what the right answer is, and it may be different in different circumstances, but that's an example of the kinds of things that uh, uh, go to the heart of your question about uh, why is that data being collected and what are you doing? And we know from, from experience that in an awful lot of cases, somebody just fills in the same uh, information for all of those fields or puts false information or non-information uh, in, in those fields. Uh, and so it's clear that there is quite a bit of ambiguity as to whether those things have any real value. Those are the kind of things that ought to be nailed down. It's kind of embarrassing as a community that we have uh, things as loosely defined or ill-defined as it is. Well, thank you for those thoughts. Yes, well, I guess it's also the, the, the effect of uh, an internet that has evolved and become something that we didn't really foresee at all when we started, uh, uh, when we created these databases and we started these systems. So it's quite understandable, but yes, indeed, it's something that we should take upon us to, to also resolve. 
I'm, I'm going to use that, Narani. I, I think the amount of excess baggage is a measure of success. Uh, <laughs> in a peculiar there you way. go. <laughs> I guess failed startups never have these problems. So, <laughs> um, so I will give uh, the the participants one last chance to ask a question. But uh, in the meantime, I might actually ask you what the next steps are. You had a slide on the next steps um about um how do you get involved if the, you want to provide feedback or get involved in your work um what are the next steps as you see them so we're scrambling pretty hard to bring all of this into the public as i said we're in the process of creating a nonprofit organization uh to provide a little more energy into this uh this has been a uh, uh, an unfunded volunteer effort uh, most of the hard work I've done, the other, the other people have been enormously helpful as subject matter experts and uh, as a sounding board and uh, uh, providing motivation uh, and insight. Uh, but we need, to, we need to shift up a level. Um, my hope is to be able to, to make this visible uh, uh, within the next month or so. Um, hopefully prior to the ICANN meeting, if, if we can do it, um, and make tools available. Uh, if people want to contact me, just send me email, steve at shinkuro.com, um, and I'd be happy to respond uh, and uh, watch this space, I guess, as they say. Okay, thank you very much. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you to everyone who participated. Participated. Thank you for those of you who participated live and asked questions, as well as those of you who are watching it afterwards on the Lynx website or on YouTube. So yes, if you want to get involved, please get in touch with Steve. And please do keep an eye out on the Lynx website for upcoming presentations and tutorials. We have some really interesting speakers and talks coming up. Uh, so make sure to register for those now. You'll also be able to watch uh, some of our past talks from there and on the YouTube channel and with that of course a very special thank you to you steve for taking the time uh, to share this very interesting presentation it's been a real pl pleasure listening to your talk and it's very encouraging to see uh, how you continue to contribute in the community so thank you very much again and a big virtual applause to you thank and with you. that i will say please well, I was just going to, to echo back. Thank you, Nirani and Holly, for inviting me and for uh, organizing this. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, and I look forward to future interaction. Again, thanks. Thank you. And I see there are lots of very positive comments in the chat as well. So with that, I will say thank you. Be well, stay healthy and safe. And hope to see you all again very soon. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. And remember, there's plenty more where that came from, which can be found on our virtual events page. The link is in the chat. We hope to see you for the next Links Presents with Todd Underwood on all of our ML ideas are bad and we should feel bad on Wednesday, the 30th of September. The link to register will also be in the chat. Thank you and hopefully see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>